Welcome to Troweling Down, Biblical Archaeology for the 21st Century. Hi, I'm Gary Byers. This is Dr. Steve Collins, the director of the Tal al Hammam Excavations. I ah, kind of call him a rock star. And he's our guy, and we're glad to be with you today to share with you some stuff that's come from our excavations at Tal al Hammam in Jordan. Hey, Steve, say a word about Harvest Handbook of Bible Lands, because you actually have some pics of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, in fact, almost everything we talk about uh, in the Troweling Down series, there are pictures of it <laughs> yeah. in the book. So um, the Harvest Handbook came out this year. It's a 2020 publication, so it's really recent. And everything you need to know about the background, the backdrop, the culture, the society, the politics, the religion, everything that gives a, a, a background to the Bible is in here. Yeah. In fact, if I can quote here from uh, Walter Kaiser, terrific scholar, he said, the scope of your learning will be unlimited and enhanced by leaps and bounds as you use this wonderful tool. Um, and, and I concur. And not because you and I wrote for this, <laughs> and I was the primary editor yes, on were. it, but because it's just really good. It is. And so it's terrific. Don't read your Bible without this. This is, this is the background information you need. It's up to date. It's the latest, latest cutting edge archaeology and historical studies that relate to Scripture. So that's a great book. I hope you get it. But uh, we're going to talk about something that you actually have pictures of in, in, inside the book. Yes. And um, uh, we're going to talk about dolmens. Yes. Steve, what's a dolmen? Well, a dolmen is, uh, it comes from the uh, old Britain word, I think, uh, and also finds its way into Celtic, I think, but the old Britain word for table. Yeah. So what it is, is a faux cave. Faux I mean, cave. if you live in an area and you don't have any, if you like to bury your ancestors in caves, but you don't have any, then sometimes they would build dolmens to, to accommodate. So these are two upright stones, or three, or even four upright stones, creating a chamber in the middle, and then a flat stone on top, Which, creating the, the table. table. The table look, yes. Now that, um, where we are, we have over 1,500 original dolmens around our site at Tal Hammam. It's a huge megalithic field of all kinds of stone alignments and, and dolmens and minhirs and hinges and, uh, and many uh, features that were used in religion in antiquity and particularly for the honoring of ancestors. So uh, a dolmen is not technically a tomb in, the, in that sense. It is a memorial monument that is opened up probably annually on a ritual calendar and you open it up and you go down to the family tomb somewhere in one of the in one of the wadis or ravines that's been dug in mm -hmm. or using a natural cave and that's where the actual bones are of your ancestors you take a rib or a token bone and you bring it in a ceremony to the dolmen you bring some pots of maybe oil or grain uh, small vessels and you open it up and with great ceremony you place them in to honor the ancestors and then you close up the dolmen once again. So uh, the dolmens we think are, they're not primary burials because they, we never have primary burials inside. But what we do have, and we've excavated three undisturbed ones, and in those three undisturbed burial chambers or, or memorial chambers, we have find dozens and dozens and dozens of pots, small vessels that have been entered and re-entered over almost 3,000 years. And those 3,000 years would be from when to when? From about 4,000 B.C. down to about 1,700 B.C. So that's a, a pretty long range of, of, of people. And at Tal al Hammam, they seem to be extended families for those years. All the same families living in the same houses in the same city for a couple of thousand years. Yes, for about th actually about for about 3,000 years, we have completely unbroken occupation. 
So the same families with the same traditions, the same religion, the same ethnicity, probably the same language. Of course, that language would be changing slightly over time. But uh, it's the same culture living in the same city in the same place for three millennia until, of course, it's finally destroyed around 1700 B.C. And so that family would have this family memorial structure, this dolmen, and, and they would periodically visit the dolmen is what we would understand based on what we, we, what we find. We don't have any ancient texts about dolmens. Yeah, think about the 4th of July, think about Memorial Day celebrations, Veterans Day celebrations, whatever. You, these uh, are sort of rolled into one honoring the ancestors, and so they would probably go out on one evening a year. We don't know this for sure because we have no written text, but uh, they would go out with great ceremony along ritual pathways, walking with torches uh, and, and having bonfires and dancing and singing, and then the, and then the ceremonial opening of the dolmen and the placing of the ritual offering uh, in honor of uh, our departed, and these might be, because some of these uh, ancestors might be military people, military uh, soldiers, uh, some of them might be wives and, and, and children, and so we're, we're, mem we're memorializing our culture yeah. and the people who built it. So um, we did talk the other day, Tal El Hammam, 64 acres, of, of uh, inside a city wall and even extra mural outside. Lots of outside. More, more mm -hmm. other people living. So in, in the ancient world, there might have been a death a day going on in that community. Would, based on what we know of, of death rates in antiquity, uh, mm -hmm. most people were only living to be about 40, 40 to 50 years of age. The average death age is around 30. Yeah. And so a lot of disease, which they can't deal with, a lot of, you know, just, you know, you fall down and break your arm and it gets infected and you die. Yeah. You know, we don't, they didn't have medicine in, in our, our modern sense. And so the, um, the mortality rate was very, very high. Yeah. And so they probably didn't have a day in their life when there wasn't some kind of a funeral going on. Yeah. So this is not for a funeral. This is for some sort of memorial annually or whenever and the whole family would participate and it would be in honor and remembrance of uh, departed loved ones. Yes. So um, now, now dolmens are known from, they're known as far away as, as Japan and all the way to, uh, to Britain. Yes. That whole part of the world, dolmens are known. Uh, they're known from that early period and a, a little later in different countries. And structurally, they're very similar. Very similar. But they do have different purposes. I'm not... I'm not really up on the ones in Japan and Korea, but um, the ones in, in Brit Brittany, in France, and in England, I've seen most of those. And uh, having studied those, they are primary burials. Those are. In that those part of the are. World, in the, in the but West. in our part of the world, in the Middle East and Near East, we don't, ha we don't see them as primary burials. We see them as memorial deposits in honor of ancestors. Now, many of our colleagues in the Middle East still refer to them as tombs, but uh, there have been very few that have been excavated. As, as far as I know, we're the only team that has excavated intact, undisturbed dolmen chambers. And, and that would be all around the, the Middle East. It's, they've just not been excavated. So They're really easy for, for tomb robbers or robbers to go in and steal the pottery and sell it in the antiquities market. This is yeah. one of the favorite places to get it. Yeah. And so most of these, in fact, out of, four, out of 500 dolmens, remaining dolmens that we registered in our dolmen field from an original 1500, there were only about 500 left. And of those, only three we discovered had not been disturbed. And because they were a little bit covered over with erosion and were kind of invisible until we uncovered them. And uh, once, um, once they're known and you don't protect them, they're going to get robbed. So if you find it, you got to dig it you gotta all dig out, it get it done. Yeah. And so we found three and, and maybe the only excavation in the, the ancient Near East that's found three intact, intact dolmens. dolmens. Now... Uh, you said undisturbed, 
And yet, we did find they were disturbed, but all of them were disturbed over 3,700 years ago. They were disturbed purposefully according to the typical ethnic uh, cultural rituals uh, of, of the dead. And so we, we have, in, in, in the three that we excavated, we have some pottery that goes back to the uh, early Bronze Age. Do we go earlier than the early Bronze Age? Yes, I think they go back to the late Calcolithic. So period. we had so some around, at least, back to at least around 4,000 BC, if not before. So the the late Calcolithic. Then we have some early Bronze, one, two, or three. Three, all of it. Some mm -hmm. intermediate Bronze Age. Yes. And in one of the three, we found a a Middle Bronze Age vessel. We found a, a piriform juglet in one of the dolmens, and uh, it shocked us really. Um, which proved that those dolmens were still being ritually used all the way into the Middle Bronze Age. Yeah. So that particular dolmen had been opened and closed and opened and closed ritually over at least probably 3,000 years. And that one is the one that had like 20 intact vessels. 20 or 30, yeah. Almost all of them miniature. They were small sized. Yes. Um, you know, not, not the full-size vessels we're used to at the house, but made specially for and such a And who knows how many times it had been cleaned out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we did find a, a, a ritual, sort of a receptacle for, for junk that you took out to clean. Because if you're going to continually put stuff in it over thousands of years, it's going to fill up. And so what do you do when it fills up? The family dolmen fills up, and you got to go in there, maybe ritually cleanse it out, take the stuff out, take it down the hill, dump it in a, a deposit, which we found one of these deposits, and, um, and, and then start using it again. And they did the same thing in the tombs with, with the bodies. Once, once the flesh was off the body, they, they had unceremoniously, it looks like, they would just move the, the bones out for the next body to be laid down. Yes, yeah, sort of like, excuse me, uncle. Yeah. You know, Uncle Ahab. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. he's not really here anymore, I, I guess, is what yeah. they were comfortable yeah. with. But anyway, so, um, so these dolmens are, are really unique. They're found in, in much of, of, of the, uh, the world from, from Britain to, to Japan uh, in, in that area. But in the ancient Near East, they're unique, um, have unique purposes. And we've excavated maybe the only three. And uh, we knew about this, this one do dolmen that had the middle bronze shirt in it. Then middle bronze vessels. It, middle, it was a completely intact vessel, vessel complete form juglet. Then we were organizing the pottery from our 15 seasons uh, two weeks ago, and you got a hold of a. Um, in fact, it was it, it was it was this bag. And and it had only one shirt in it. Now other pieces might well they were other pieces from this dolmen were in the, uh, are in the Department of Antiquities, right. the whole vessels in Jordan. So we, we couldn't but bring we those. we have the pieces. But this, this piece, this, this piece came out. I'm having trouble getting it out of here. Okay, so there's, there we, this is how we store the, the, the vessels. We store them in bags here. And this says HD 78, Hammam Dolman 78, 2009 and 10. And then it has a number on it, just like it's, it's written on here. There's a, there's a number. Uh, 3950, and that's the accession number in our database that you can go and find out where it came from. And this one is really special because... Well, um, in the palace, in, in the Middle Bronze Age palace, and of course that's the time of Abraham, we have this kind of fa fancy ware. It's, we call it multi-slipped, cross-wiped palace ware. Because there's lots of slip, slipping on it. That is a soupy slip. is a soupy clay that you paint the vessel with. And you can see this one has multiple colors. It has this color, and then it has a darker color over the top of it, so sort of an orange and then a brown. And then this one has a whitish color, has a brownish color, and a, and a pinkish or orangish color. And it's cross-wiped going lots of different directions. Even the base, look at this, is a nice disc base, and even the base is painted. So it would sit like, sit like this. Yes, and, uh, and, and you can see the painting on the inside so it here. A bowl. It's a bowl. Now what's interesting about this is 
is we have become so accustomed to this very specialized type of surface treatment from the Middle Bronze Age in the palace that every time we see it, we instantly can identify it. Yeah. And what's interesting is that this piece from Dolman 78, when we originally looked at it, we didn't really, it didn't really register with us. In fact, we, we, I don't think we probably called this Right. But we were looking at it again the other day, and instantly when we looked at this, we went, oh my goodness, palace ware from the Middle Bronze Age in this dolmen. And which, which was a confirmation because we had a Middle Bronze Age vessel from, from the same dolmen, and now from that dolmen we have a piece, just a little fragment, but a telling piece of palace ware. And the fact that it's fragmentary tells me that at some point during the Middle Bronze Age, the dolmen was cleaned out and they broke a vessel and a piece of one of those vessels remained there and on they went uh, with their ceremonies and eventually um, they had to clean it out over and over. But so, the piece was left behind. They were still uh, using that dolmen during the Middle Bronze Age. That's the exciting thing. So um, we, we know this comes from the palace, and we don't find it anywhere else. It's just, it's, it's palace ware. That now, was our, now, now our we term. have found now, now that we know this ware very, very well, we have found uh, some good pieces of it down in the temple area. So, but it's only being found in areas of sort of upper, the upper divisions of society. Places where priests and administrators and, you know, Palace, palace uh, personnel uh, would be using it, including the king and his family. Important people like our Italian filmmaker uh, Daniel there. Yeah. And so, so this, this is palace ware, and that's a piece of palace ware found at the dolmen, an amazing find. Yeah, not at it, in it. In it. In the chamber. In, down inside. And if that's going to get, and if you saw these chambers, they're pretty tight. I mean, they're sealed, they're hard to get to. And uh, if this is in that chamber, it was purposefully put there. It didn't, and it's and it's probably what a half a half a kilometer or three quarters of a kilometer away from the city. Yeah. Now you can see the city from there. It has a complete view of the city, but uh, this thing was put there purposefully. I don't know how exciting this is for you, but it was a big deal for us, and uh, we love this stuff, and it just helps us to understand the ancient world better the world of the Bible, and that's what this is all about for now, us. Now, let me ask you a question. The Hammam Dolman Field, which is a sacred area, has been a sacred area for thousands of years by the time of Jacob. Yeah. Who brought Jacob's body to this Dolman Field? Well, according to Genesis chapter 50, uh, 49, uh, Joseph seemed to have brought his father's body Based on what the Bible says, the names the Bible uses and the names of the site from ancient Egyptian texts and in the Bible, it looks like they, on their way to Canaan, went the roundabout way through Jordan, the King's Highway, and wound up at Tal el Hammam, a, a bell it's called, and that's where they had a, a ceremony, a great big ceremony, weeping for Abraham, weeping for Jacob. And in fact, the Bible says that the locals that were around there called the place Abel Mitzrayim, weeping of the Egyptians. And we think that, that, that was, this was the very location. These, this stuff comes from that place where that story happened in Genesis 49. Yes. And so it was a, it was a ritual center, had been for a, thousand, a couple thousand years or several thousand mm -hmm. years. And this area was actually under the Egyptian administration yeah. That time. had been for a long time and after Sodom was destroyed at the period of that particular Egyptian administration Jacob came along a couple of generations later same group of people same, uh, ruling Egypt who were sort of Canaanites ruling in Egypt uh, we call those people the Hyksos and then they must have known about this ritual place and they brought Jacob's body I think they laid him on top of one of those dolmens and they mourned him uh, as he lay there on top of a dolmen for uh, seven yeah. days. Yeah. So, pretty interesting stuff. 
It's the Bible. It's archaeology. It's history. Troweling down is what we do. Join us again next time.